The rise of Hollywood in filmmaking saw the birth of a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry, which despite all of its faults has given rise to some of the greatest works of arts and media in our lifetime. However, the tragic death of cinematographer Elena Hutchinson on the set of Alec Baldwin's movie Rust reminded us that behind all the lights, the glitz, and the glamour, filmmaking at times can be extremely dangerous. Hello everyone, welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. Join me today as we discuss when making movies gets deadly. As I said, the negligence on the set of Rust is by far the most prominent example in modern times of when making movies gets deadly. And as sad as it is, Hutchinson is really just one of many people that have lost their lives in the pursuit of art and filmmaking. In this video, I'm going to be discussing some of the most deadly and infamous examples of when filmmaking gets deadly, beginning with the 1982 Steven Spielberg directed movie adaptation of the sci-fi TV series, Twilight Zone. Yes, you've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, 1982. The 1982 movie edition of the popular ongoing TV series, The Twilight Zone featured a star-studded group of actors from the 80s, featuring Dan Aykroyd, John Lithgow, Albert Brooks, and it was produced and directed partially by Steven Spielberg. The film featured four kind of short story sessions, each unique from one another in a very kind of Twilight Zone fashion, each of these stories having strange twists and turns, but unfortunately, it was the first of these four stories featured in the movie where disaster would strike. The segment was titled Time Out and was a rework of two other Twilight Zone episodes, the episode Time Out combined with the episode Back There. The premise of the story for this episode followed the story of a racist army lieutenant, Bill Connor, as he suddenly time travels, experiencing different situations which give him a lesson on empathy. It's kind of almost like a weird version of like a Christmas Carol with the dreams, but like a lot more bigoted. First, he is sent to Nazi-occupied France, where he is chased by German soldiers who think that he's Jewish. What? From here, he is transported to rural Alabama in the 1950s, where a group of KKK members see him as a black man and attempt to capture him. Finally, he is transported to the Vietnam War, where he is being fired at by American soldiers who view him as Vietnamese. It was the filming of these whole Vietnamese scenes that would ultimately result in the deaths of one adult and two children. Actor Vic Morrow, who played the main character Bill, and two illegally hired child actors, Mika Din Lee and Renee Shin Ye Chun. After receiving backlash from the studio that Moreau's character Bill was too unsympathetic, the producer John Landis, remember this is co-produced and co-directed, hurriedly wrote a new scene where Moreau's character would redeem himself by saving two Vietnamese children while being pursued by an American helicopter, which would destroy a small village behind him in this really big pyrotechnic kind of crescendo. As they were filming these scenes though, disaster would strike. You see the large pyrotechnic charges that they used at this time were making it very difficult for the low-flying helicopter to remain stable. This got even worse when suddenly two of these charges were detonated together and very close to one another, making it extremely hard for the helicopter to stay in flight, as suddenly it spun out of control, crashing into the ground, hitting Moreau and the chill children. All three were killed instantly in really graphic ways. The actor Moreau, though, it seems, had some kind of like almost premonition to these events, as years earlier in the filming of another movie with a helicopter, he would make sure to have $1 million life insurance policy taken out before he would shoot any scene involving a helicopter. It was reported the man was even quoted to have said, I have always had a premonition that I was going to die in a helicopter crash. Ultimately, the deaths of Moreau and these two children actors would be a major catalyst for change in Hollywood, as during this time, directors wielded a vast amount of power in the moving making uh, industry. And we have to remember that these scenes with the helicopter and the children were added in the middle of film filming by co-director John Landis. The two child actors were hired illegally and they were paid under the table as this time in California law prohibited child actors from working nights or working in proximity to explosives. I mean, that makes sense, right? During the subsequent trial, John Landis denied any culpability for the accident 
in any form. He did, though, admit that hiring the children was wrong, but ultimately Landis, along with the rest of the people that were charged, were acquitted from all manslaughter charges. Ultimately, any scene involving the children in the helicopter crash were cut out from the movie, but you know what they say. In Hollywood, man, the show must go on, and eventually the Twilight Zone movie would wrap and debut in cinemas to mix reviews. Ultimately, the movie made $42 million at the box office after a $10 million investment, and many believe that the movie has one of the most horrifying opening scenes of any horror movie ever. Ultimately, though, the movie could never shake the tragic events that unfolded in its production, and when you compare it to our kind of modern instance of... Um, when filmmaking goes wrong in Rust, it really is crazy the level of uh, negligence that can happen on sets of these major movie industries. The Crow, 1994. The Crow was a supernatural superhero movie starring Bruce Lee's son, Brandon Lee. The movie followed the story of The Crow, Eric Draven, a musician who is resurrected from death to seek revenge against the gang who murdered him and his fiance. In a tragic twist, the comic book was written by James O'Barr after the unexpected death of his real life fiance. Little did O'Barr know, but more tragedy was in his future. The Crow is remembered fondly by many people as a cult classic, but I think what it is more famous for is the tragic death of the lead actor and son of legendary actor and martial artist Bruce Lee. His son being Brandon Lee, who was shot and killed in an accident with a dummy firearm on the set of The Crow in events that very much kind of parallel what we saw in the last couple of years with Rust. The dummy gun in question for Crow was a 44 Magnum and the gun had been used two weeks prior in filming another scene before the tragic scene where Brandon Lee was shot. The scene prior was a close-up scene and due to the nature of the close-up scene in filming at this time, oftentimes producers would use um, dummy rounds as opposed to blank rounds when filming these close-up scenes because it is easier to tell a blank is a fake gunshot as opposed to a dummy round. Basically, a dummy round or a dummy cartridge is a bullet but without gunpowder or primer to make these scenes more realistic. However, though, in The Crow, instead of normally purchasing these dummy cartridges, the film crops crew decided to make them themselves by pulling the bullet from the live rounds, dumping the powder charge but not the primer, and then reinserting the bullet. Because they did not remove the primer, it was possible that the primer itself could detonate, with w which would be enough force, enough energy to push the bullet and lodge it into the barrel of said gun, which is likely what happened here. Weeks later, Brandon Lee was shooting a scene where his character Eric would be shot from around 15 feet away. This is Eric's death scene. Because of this, the homemade dummy rounds were exchanged for blank rounds, which we remember blank rounds feature a lied powder charge and primer, but have no bullet. If you've seen the movie The Prestige, this is basically how they do the bullet catch trick. Later on, after the accident on the crow, it was reported the prop assistant was unaware of the rule of inspecting all firearms before handing them uh, on the set, and he had not cleared the bullet for any obstructions after the blanks were loaded. So therefore, when the gun was fired in the filming of the scene with the blank rounds, the bullet, which was most likely lodged in the barrel, was suddenly ejected, strikingly in the abdomen. The young man would die shortly after. It's kind of crazy to think about, right? It, to me, it kind of just seems like a no-brainer that every time that anyone is handling a gun on the live set of a movie that it should be checked in all aspects and have the barrel cleared. But I guess this just uh, isn't common sense for everybody. The writer of the comic, Obar, remarked after uh, Brandon Lee's death that losing Lee was like losing his fiance all over again, and the man wished that he had never written the comic in the first place. The movie would eventually be finished as Lee had already shot like 90-95% of the entire movie and the scenes that they didn't have were eventually made up and done with his stunt double. The movie would go on to be a success and is viewed by many to be Eric Lee's best work as an actor and in his beloved as a cult classic superhero movie. It is shocking though to see the similarities between Lee's death and what would happen nearly 20 years later on the set of Rust. You really have to feel for Brandon Lee's poor mother. She had now seen the death of her husband, Bruce Lee, and then within, what, 20 plus years, the death of her own son. Noah's Ark, 1928. Noah's Ark, 1928, was considered a cinema classic for its pioneering role in the transition from the silent film era to the talkie era. Also, it happens to be one of the first major productions from Warner Brothers Picture. Many of you may know about this Noah's Ark movie from its inclusion in our video about lost movies who people are desperate to find, but Noah's Ark features the classic tale of Noah from the Bible, shocker, interlaced with the story 
story of the United States in World War One. Basically, the movie opens with Americans in World War One, and there's this scene where a priest compares World War One and the flow of blood in the war to the biblical story of Noah and the flowing of the water. In the story of Noah, God decides in all of his mighty wisdom that he is going to flood the world. So he commands Noah, his most loyal follower, to build a big ass boat and then collect two of every animal, yada, 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 you know the story. You see, Warner Brothers, the big WB themselves, really wanted to up the ante for this film. If they were going to put a biblical tale into cinema form, they wanted it to be epic. And epic it was, as it was reported that over 7,500 extras apparently worked on this film. The problem was, though, that even with all of these people, it wasn't epic enough. And to really do this movie justice, they had to get one thing right the flood scene. The flooding of the entire known world is no small affair, and our boys over at the WB really wanted to do it justice. Their big plan, you might ask, to pump 600,000 gallons of water down onto the poured underpaid extras down below. Many of these extras already standing in basically like shoulder deep water, the force of the thousands of gallons being rained down upon them, combined with the chaos of the numbers of actors around them, resulted in this tragedy. Three actors would drown during the filming of these scenes. One victim's injuries were so bad that their leg had to be amputated though they would survive, and numerous others suffered other broken limbs and many other serious injuries. Among those who were nearly injured was a young John Wayne, who was only 20 at the time and working as an extra. Step down, Pilgrim. Pilgrim. Pilgrim! Hey, Pilgrim! Pilgrim. Despite the deaths and arguably the most important scene of the movie, the WB would truck on and the film would be finished. And to the shock of many on the release of this movie, many of these flood scenes were kept in the film. Some of these scenes being really shocking and graphic, where people are generally struggling and you can see them getting injured, apparently you could even see some drowning, and these shots were all left in the film. Upon its release, people were shocked and horrified, so it didn't take long for the WB to withdraw the film and edit out over 30 minutes of it, including most of these troubling flood scenes, and then re-release the movie. Ultimately, Noah's Ark would be a box office failure in addition to causing the deaths of three people and hurting a fuck ton of others. At the very least, though, I guess I can say it did lead to uh, stunt safety regulations being implemented in Hollywood the following year, but obviously these wouldn't prevent more untold deaths uh, within the filmmaking industry. The Viking, 1931. The Viking, renamed to White Thunder, was a 1930s American adventure film about sealing. Yep, they made a movie about hunting seals. What? Set on the coast of Newfoundland, the story depicts a rivalry between a seal hunter, Jed Nelson, and his rival, Luke Orem. Jed worrying that Luke would steal his girlfriend, he goads Luke into joining him on an Arctic expedition set on the ship, the Viking. Basically, these guys sail out, both of these men end up in hunting parties on these icy shores and eventually find themselves stranded. Jed tries to kill Luke, but he can't because the snow is too blinding, and ultimately the two make up, becoming the best of friends. Happy ending, happily ever after for everyone. Well, not really. You see, The Viking is famous for being the first film to record sound and dialogue on location with magnetic wiring, but it's probably more infamous for being the singlest deadliest event in all of filmmaking history. 27 to 25 men, including the movie's producer, Varric Frissel, would all die in an explosion on March 15, 1931, while trying to film an iceberg. It's unknown exactly what caused said explosion. The Viking you see was carrying a large amount of explosives on the ship that day, as explosives at this time were what were used to clear these large sheets of ice. And seeing as they were trying to get a shot of these large pieces of ice um, breaking, that was the whole entire point of why these 30 men were out there, they had a lot of explosives on the boat. It's unknown exactly what happened, but two explosions would rock the Viking, the ship being blown into two pieces as fire began to spill out. While I couldn't find an accurate number of people who died, reports varied between 27 and 29. Regardless, the disaster on the Viking would forever stand as the largest loss of life in the history of filmmaking. The film was later released in 1931 despite the accident, as most of the filming for the movie had already wrapped up by this point. The film was actually thought to be lost 
lost for many years until a copy was later found in a remote village in the 1960s. The entire movie can actually be watched on YouTube, and the Viking is still known today as the deadliest event in all of filmmaking history. And yes, these were just a few of many, many, many examples of when filmmaking gets dangerous. Let me know in the comment section down below other famous uh, events of filmmaking where things got dangerous, and maybe we'll make a part two of this video if people like part one. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. If you did like the video or learn something new, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe as it really does help the channel out and help the channel grow. If you'd like to see more content, then please click one of the videos on screen now. As always, guys, I hope to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there. Hug your mother. Drink your water. Until next time, peace, love, autumn.